I just want to read verse uh, 7 halfway through again, and we'll look at a few verses in Romans 8. I just want to read you the greeting in Romans 1, verse 7. Romans 1, verse 7. And we'll look at a few verses in Romans 8. I will read all the verses. Please listen and look, uh, follow in your Bibles. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm picking up in Romans chapter 8, verse 7. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But, Christ, but if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who, in, who dwells in you. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him, in order that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that, that the present sufferings of this present time are not worthy comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revelation of the sons of God. For creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. That the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit groan inwardly as we Wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Let us pray. Our gracious God, our heavenly Father, we worship you, we praise you. Father, we are in awe. Father, we are dumbfounded when we consider the good tidings, the glad tidings you give us in your word, the good news you give us in your word. Father, we worship you, we adore you, we bow before you, O God. Father, we do ask for you that you would speak to us this evening. Help us to understand this great salvation. Help us to understand the depths of salvation. Help us never to be cold. Help us, Lord, to be lost in wonder and in amazement when we consider thy great salvation. Father, help us to examine ourselves. Help us never to be lukewarm. 
Help us, O oh God, that we may be flamed with love for you in our hearts. We pray that you would speak to us. Father, I pray for myself as I share a few thoughts. I pray that you would give me wisdom and guidance. I pray that you would take hold of my mouth, my thoughts, and use my words for the building up of your people, for the glory of your own name. I ask for wisdom, my Father. I pray these things in the name of Jesus, my Lord and my Savior. Amen. As we look at the greeting in this chapter in, in Romans 1 verse 7, many of us quickly skim over the greeting. We do not like the introductory verses. We do not like the ending verses. We heard a message on the ending verses. So we get to the beginning verses now. We must never think Paul was merely a formal person. He was following the culture of his time. We must never think so. Behind the greeting is this great gospel that is summarized. And we must stop and read every verse and we must look at them carefully. In this verse, the whole of the Christian message is presented in the greeting itself. The verse that we, the part of the verse that I re read begins with grace. Salvation always begins with grace. Salvation belongs to God. It begins in the grace, in the unmerited favor of God. And what is the end goal of this salvation? The end goal of this salvation is peace. Peace with God. Adam, when he was in the garden, he was in this perfect relationship with God. God was his father. In the book of Luke, we read when Luke was tracing the ancestry of Adam, he says, Adam, the son of God. When Adam was created, he had this image of God. He was perfect and he was in this communion with God. He had perfect peace. But he forfeited that privilege by sinning against God. And when God, in his wisdom, devised this great plan of salvation, the goal is to restore us fallen beings to the state that Adam was in. Just as Adam was relating to God as father, and he was at perfect peace with the father, we also, in salvation, the end goal is to be at peace with God, the Father, in his very presence. Salvation's goal is to bring us to this state where we do not worship an imp impersonal God. We are not like the pagans, worshiping an unknown God. In Acts chapter 17, the pagans in, the, in this city that Paul goes to to preach the gospel, in case we have forgotten a God, they build an altar. And they, say, they write on this altar, the unknown God. They were worshiping this unknown God. A Christian never worships an unknown God. A Christian comes to God, and he comes in this fashion wherein he calls God, God my Father, God our Father. Anything that falls short of it means you have not understood salvation. If you merely think salvation is I can escape hell, I can go to heaven, you have not understood the gospel. You have an incomplete understanding of the gospel. Gospel is, the final step is this, that we know our sins are forgiven, but we don't stop there. We know that we are justified. We don't stop there. 
but we move on and we come and we know that we are reconciled to God and now we are in this personal relationship and we call God my father God our father we call God as our Abba father anything short of it is you have not understood the gospel now how can any man how can any uh, person come to this state of calling God our father I'm going to briefly touch what I already touched it's been four months since I've uh, since I've last talked so most of it I think would, most of us would have lost track of what was so I'm just going to quickly revise salvation always begins with God the apostle in Ephesians says that in Ephesians 1 God in eternity past has loved us and in love he marked us out for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will I read Ephesians 1 5 he predestined us he marked us out for this grand purpose God's goal in salvation remember I just mentioned to you is we are in a state of sonship the manner of our sonship is adoption when Adam had sin Adam and all his descendants have become according to the scripture children of the devil they have become children of wrath how can they be restored to communion with God as father God's answer is through Jesus Christ obviously Jesus Christ is being used as what we may call a metonym when you have a whole big idea a whole big concept you want to compress it and you put it in two words or shortened form when he says our adoption as sons is through Jesus Christ what he means is through the mediatory work through the propitiatory work through the reconciling work through the atoning work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary only through that means restoration to sonship is possible God cannot wink over sin if God were to do that he would be unjust it is impossible for God to deny justice he must deal with sin and he has dealt with sin in his own son through his son's death on the cross God's justice is satisfied my sins your sins were laid upon his son he laid upon him the iniquities of all of us all he himself bore our sins in his own body these are scriptures I am just quoting from 1 Peter 2 the Lord Jesus was our sin bearer he himself paid the punishment for our sin through this satisfaction of God's justice in dealing with sin God now is able to adopt sinners into his family the manner of our sonship is adoption why did God send his son into this world we must always have a holistic view please turn to Galatians 4 I've quoted this frequently and this should be on our hearts if we merely think that oh I must be released from the condemnation of God's law I must be released from the charge sheet that was against me we are wrong that's an incomplete view the apostle in Galatians 4 says this when the fullness of time had come God sent forth his son number one to redeem those who were under the law meaning to redeem to free those who were under the law's curse we all have sinned we all have broken the law the punishment of the law was upon us a curse was hanging on our head 
God sent his son to release us from the curse of the law. And at second number two, so that after releasing us from the curse of the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. The end goal. Yes, we must be released from the lost condemnation and lost curse. True, but it doesn't end there. It goes on that we might be we might receive adoption as sons. We might be restored to sonship. Salvation begins in the plan of God and through the work of his son, God is able. God has provided the means by which we can be adopted into God's family. Yes, that is true from God's side, God does this. How can you and I know that we are sons of God, we are daughters of God, we are children of God? How can we know we can address God as our Father? Is there any test to know whether, the, whether we can know we are sons and daughters of God? Is there any test? Is there something experientially, experimentally, I can know whether I am a child of God or not? Scripture has this, how do you know that you're in a right relationship to God? Scripture has a positive test. I want to turn to Ephesians 1 again. This is how you can know you are in a right relationship to God. This is how you can know you are adopted into God's family. This is how you can know you can confidently call God as God, my Father. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In Him, in the Lord Jesus, meaning in, in, in Jesus Christ our Lord, in Him, you also, when you have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Jesus Christ, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Now in verse 13, when a person believes in the gospel, when a person hears the word of truth and believes the gospel of salvation and believes in Jesus Christ, our Lord, this is what happens. An after effect is this. He is sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. With the promise of the Holy Spirit, he is sealed. And I've been uh, dwelling on that word called sealed. I want to quickly remind you before I get to the third, third uh, point that I, I, I have. I've told you in the past, a seal. What is a seal? A seal is something that is used to authenticate, to prove something as genuine. I have given you the example of a currency note. Years ago, I worked in a bookstore, and whenever I was uh, given a $100 bill, I was asked by my manager, she would give me this marker, and she would say, write on the marker, if it changes the color, that means that is a duplicate, that's a fake note. But if this sketch that she gave me, the same color is maintained on the currency note, it was a genuine note. It had the seal of the United States of America, and it's a genuine, authentic note. A seal of the United States of America is on that note, and thus you can know it is genuine, it is true. It is authentic. When a person comes to saving faith, there is this seal of the Holy Spirit. There is this, what we call, genuine, real, authentic transformation. There is no easy believism. There is no, I believe in the gospel and I love sin. There is no such thing. A person who is under the influence, under the operation 
of the Holy Spirit, under the seal of the Holy Spirit, is authentically transformed, is genuinely transformed. The apostle in Romans 8 talks of a person who is under the operation of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God has touched this person. And this is the attitude of this person. You see, before he was converted, he did not give glory to God. He loved sin. He, he had great pleasure in sin. But he's converted. This is what happens to this man. Before he was converted. Let, let me read verse 7. For the mind that is set on the flesh. Flesh meaning the mind that is set on sin nature. The mind of the fallen nature. The mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. Is at enmity with God. Why? Why is the man in sin at enmity with God? Because God's word declares that he is a sinner, declares, exposes his darkness, exposes that he must face the holy God. And so he, he, his pride comes in the way and he says, no, no, I'm not as bad as you say I am. Who are you to say I am? He does not give glory to God. And he is hostile to God. He is at enmity with God. Because God points out his sin to him. His pride comes in the way. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed it cannot. For those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But this is the condition of a believer. This is the condition of a person who has come under the influence, under the operation, under the seal of the Holy Spirit. Verse 9. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. I'm going to read verse 11. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead also gives life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. What is the apostle saying? You see, if you are truly born again, if you are converted, the spirit of God is in you. He indwells you. What does he do? He gives you life. He gives you life to your mortal body. Earlier you were a slave to the members of your body. You were... You are a slave to sin. But what does the Spirit of God do? The Spirit of God, when He comes to you, He indwells you. What does He do? He gives life. He gives you power to put to death the deeds of the body. He gives you life. He gives you ability. He gives you power to please God. Verse 12, so then brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you by the spirit put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. What does he do when he comes into our life? When we are under the seal of the spirit? The spirit of God mortifies, puts to death. The deeds of the body. He gives us life. He gives us power. And he, he gives us a new direction. Verse 14. Earlier the direction was to. Not give glory to God. Not to follow God. But here is what he does. For all who are led by the spirit of God. Are sons of God. He gives us a new nature. And what does he do? He enables us to, to be, he leads us. He leads us in such a way that we say no to sin. 
We deny ungodliness. We deny worldly desires. We live self-controlled. We live righteous. We live upright lives. He produces in us the fruit of the Spirit. He enables us to obey God's word. He enables us to run away from sin. And the minute we sin, we are bothered. Our consciences are troubled. Our strength is gone until we get right with God. He, there is this intense grief, pain in our hearts until we repent, until we get right with God. This is what the Spirit of God does. The Spirit of God brings authentic, genuine change. There is no such thing as easy believism. The gospel is repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus. It is not merely faith in the Lord Jesus. Repent, a turning away from sin. Coming to God and obeying the word of God. A person who is under the influence, under the seal of the spirit. A genuine, authentic change happens in his life. He is transformed. His life has a new direction. The seal, we looked at this when the Holy Spirit operates on us, we have this authentic, genuine change. The second thing, the Spirit of God, we are sealed by the Spirit of God, has a second application. When we think of a seal, a seal is used to guarantee somebody's possession. I gave the example last time. You buy something you are given a title deed. On the title deed, there is this stamp. There is this authorization from the state saying, this particular belonging belongs to Gautam or whoever it is. When the Spirit of God does his, has his work in us, the next thing he does is he gives us this conviction that we belong to God. We are a possession of God. I want to read for you 1 Peter 2.9. When a person comes to salvation, this is his position. But you you who are born again, you who are born again, are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. This is the phrase I want you to concentrate on. A people for his own possession. A people for God's own belonging. You see, when we are redeemed from sin, when the Lord Jesus through his, we were not redeemed with perishable things like gold and silver, but where we were redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb, we are told in 1 Peter 1. When we are redeemed, we don't come out of the slavery of sin and it's not like we are free. We have a new owner. You see, whenever a slave was released in the first century, from slavery it's not that he is free he is he belongs to another master similarly when we are released from the slavery of sin it's not that we are free but we have a new master we belong to God we are slaves of God the apostle says in uh, Romans 6 we are slaves to righteousness we belong to another master. We do his will. We do his bidding. 
in verse Romans chapter 8, verse 15. This is what happens to a true child of God. This is what happens. I'm just going to read verse 15 and 16. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, capital S, the Holy Spirit is called the spirit of adoption. As you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. You see what happens? We are in a new relationship to God. We cry, Abba, Father. And in verse 16, the apostle says these words. This is what happens to us as believers. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Do you know how you can know whether you really understand the gospel and you don't understand the gospel? Whether you're truly saved and you're not truly saved? You want to test yourself? I'll give you this test. Has a moment come in your life when you questioned yourself and said, am I truly a child of God? Were you bothered in your life at some point in your life after you embraced this faith? Were you bothered in some point in your life? Am I a child of God? Were there days of restlessness in your life? If you tell me you never experienced it, that tells me you are not. I will not say you're not saved, but I will say this. It is time to question your salvation. If you never stopped in your life, some point in your life, and question yourself, am I truly a child of God? If you have not examined yourself, you see sin in your daily life, and you are bothered about sin, and you stopped and said, I see sin in my life. Am I a child of God? Am I truly born again? If you never done that, I ask you, humbly, question yourself. Are you truly born again? Are you truly saved? Because this is what happens to true children of God. They want to know this God is their father. They want this assurance. They want to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they belong to this God and God is their father. You remember I was telling what is the essence of Christianity? What is the end goal of Christianity? What is the Christian message? Not that you will escape hell, go to heaven. Yes, that is a part of it. This position wherein we call God my father. If you never stopped in your life and sought that assurance, I say you question your salvation. True children of God want to be sure, want to be absolutely sure that they are the children of God. God is their father. And this is how we can know whether we are true children of God. Verse 16. For true children of God, this is what happens. And this is the experience of almost all believers. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. You see, I will, I'm talking to you now and you're listening. The same way I spoke to you, you would in one point of your life, you would know the Spirit of God talk to you and He has witnessed with your soul, with your deepest of being that you are a child of God. 
you would you, you may ask me how can i know when would this happen it can happen in many ways it can be in the morning you're doing your daily devotional all of a sudden you see this one particular verse pop up and it takes hold of you and you are disturbed and you are given this joy this pr one promise hits you and you are given this enlightenment and you are lost and it takes so it takes you over it is as if god has met you it is as if heaven came down and glory filled your soul and this can happen many times in your life christianity is not an impersonal religion christianity is a person knowing this god a part of knowing god is to commune with him and this god communes with you and tells you and me that we are his and he is ours christianity is not arid it is not dry it is not impersonal it is that thing that moves you from your being that you want you want to jump and you want to adore this great god for bringing you into this sonship and once you get hold of this i am a belonging i am a possession of god this would be your response what you would do is i am god's i belong to god my life my all is god's i will surrender myself wholly to god i say many of us don't surrender ourselves because we have never truly understood this 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 seal of the spirit meaning meaning possession belonging to god once we know that we belong to god there is only one response a total submission a total surrender of our wills not my will but your will be done and with that comes this assurance that god has a plan for my life god has ordained all the days of my life god has circumstantially led me all the days of my life god has a perfect plan for me and you would rejoice in this plan that god has for you for me when bad things happen to you when you understand that you are a belonging you are a possession of god you would not panic this thing comes from the wise bestowment of my father my heavenly father instead of panicking you would find great comfort god has allowed this into my life this is part of god's plan for my life you find this great assurance because you are god's nothing will shake you you don't panic easily our earthly father's plan for us our heavenly father much more and you would surrender yourself to this great god the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of god we belong to god we are a possession of god how can you know you are in your right whether you are in a right state and you are calling god our father one the seal of the holy spirit this authentic genuine change two the seal of the holy spirit this possession that you belong to god three i want you to turn back to ephesians 1 again the apostle says this when god has given you the seal of the holy spirit i'm reading verse 14 this is the purpose that god has given you the seal of the holy spirit me the whole of uh, the seal of the holy spirit to those in salvation the seal of the holy spirit verse 14 the holy spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance 
until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Now, if you're reading ESV, in the footnotes, if you look, you will find there is a word, substituting for guarantee. Who is the down payment of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it? The Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. You see, Paul says in uh, the verses just we read in, in Romans 8, the next verse, Romans 8, 17, when we are children, we are heirs of God. We are co-heirs with Christ. If you are a heir, what it means is you have an inheritance. Right? Our fathers give us an inheritance. God gives us an inheritance. And the Holy Spirit, the promised Holy Spirit, is the down payment of our inheritance. Now what is this inheritance? Let's try to understand what is this inheritance and then we'll understand what it means that the Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance. What is this inheritance? Now we have to rely on other portions of scripture, right? I want you to turn to 1 Peter. 1 Peter. Chapter 5, verse 1. The Apostle Peter is talking uh, to this believers and he's saying this. I exhort you, the elders among you, as a fellow elder and a witness of the, of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. What he's describing himself as is, I'm focusing on the second one, which is relevant to, for our discussion. He's saying this, a partaker in the glory. In other words, he's saying, there is a glory coming. I am going to be a partaker of this glory. Paul the apostle in Romans 8 says this. Romans 8 verse 18, the chapter we are just looking at. Verse 18. For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing, these are the words, with the glory, I'm sorry, that is to be revealed to us. The sufferings of this present age are not co worth comparing to the glory, the glory. In the same book, 5 2. Uh, 5 2. Paul says, Through the Lord Jesus, we have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we rejoice. We rejoice in this. We rejoice in the hope of the glory. Of God. Now I want, what is this inheritance? What is this inheritance that God has for his heirs, for his children? I want to suggest to you that this is th this glory. And I want to add additional characteristics of this glory. I want you to turn to Colossians 1, 12. Additional characteristics of this glory. Colossians 1, 12. Maybe, may, may I just read from verse 11 so we get the full, sent, full context. May you be strengthened with all power according, Colossians 1, 11 and 12. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father 
who has qualified you to share to share this is what is our inheritance this is what paul paul is saying this is the inheritance for the believer to share in the inheritance of the saints in light obviously he is not meaning physical light so an element of this glory is he is using an alternative and he is saying this great light the inheritance of the saints is this great light and he goes on to scripture gives us other clues of what what this inheritance is i want you to turn to second timothy chapter 2 verse 10 second timothy chapter 2 verse 10 paul the apostle is saying this therefore i endure everything for the sake of the elect that they may also obtain the salvation that is in christ jesus with eternal glory i endure everything why for the salvation that is in christ jesus along with it eternal glory what is the inheritance of the saints another dimension this this not just glory not just this great light but this additional element this eternal glory this unending glory this unfading glory it's not just the apostle paul saying that i want you to turn to peter 1 peter 5:10 and after 1 peter 5:10 and after you have suffered for a while 1 peter 5:10 and after you have suffered for a little while the god of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in christ will himself restore confirm strengthen and establish you so this what is the inheritance of the saints what is this inheritance god gives to his children this eternal glory this light obviously when we look at the old testament scriptures what it means is this great light this great glory what it means is the very presence of the living god god's own presence we read in exodus chapter 40 just so that we are clear that light and and glory means the very presence the immediate presence of god i want you to turn to exodus 40 we'll just look at one but we can go on and look at other portions of scripture which mean the same thing i'm just going to look at one uh, exodus 40 moses builds the tabernacle moses follows the exact blueprint that god gives him he did everything according to the commandments on the mountain and there was this inauguration there was this opening ceremony this is what happens verse 34 and the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the lord filled the tabernacle the glory of the lord filled the tabernacle and moses not was, was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it and the glory of the lord filled the tabernacle what is evidenced in a temporary sense here is given in a full sense to the believer and that inheritance of this eternal glory the holy spirit the seal of the holy spirit is the down payment in other words what is promised in full later is promised partially now when when <coughs> when a believer when a person receives the holy spirit what he receives is the immediate presence of god in in a shadowy form in a partial form someone says brother gautam how can you be so sure that the christian will experience glory here on earth 
in a temporal form, in, in, a, in, a, in a partial form. Not the full glory that is coming, but now a, a, a foretaste of that glory. How can you know that for sure? I know that for sure because believers in scripture experience this glory. 1 Peter 1. You want to know what it means to receive the Holy Spirit? You must have a foretaste of this glory here in earth. And that's how you can you can be exalt you, you can relate to this God. Again I say Christianity is not impersonal. It is personal. It is real. It is not arid, dry. It is not rituals. It is communion with the living God. And we share this glory of God in a foretasty form here and now. 1 Peter 1. The believers were suffering. And this is what the apostle Peter writes to them. Though you believers have not seen him, you love him. Oh, they were loving God. They were loving God with all of their being. They were emotional. They were not sentimental. They were emotional. Their emotion was involved. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him, now, though you do not see him now, Though, do, though you do not see him in his fullness, in that full glory now. You believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. The believers here experience the foretaste of that glory now on earth. This is eternal life that you may know the one and only true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. Glory begins now. Let me give you an additional proof that the believers in the New Testament experienced glory now. A foretaste of the glory now. Turn to the fourth chapter. Fourteen, verse 14. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. You remember what the Holy Spirit is called here? The alternative? What is the alternative word used for the Holy Spirit here? Spirit of glory when God's spirit comes indwells us he brings a foreshadowing of this coming glory we experience this as a down payment what we experience now is only a foretaste the fullness is yet to come why do you think a lady by the name Fanny J. Crosby when she wrote that blessed assurance that, that beautiful hymn why do you think she wrote those words? Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. There is only one explanation. She experienced the glory divine. She experienced Jesus personally in her life. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Christianity is personal. It's not ritual. The seal of the Holy Spirit is you, you enter into the courts of God. You know him personally. It's not rituals. The Holy Spirit is this down payment, is this pledge of the coming full inheritance. We experience God in a foretasty form now. 
Let's go back to Romans 8. In our passage that we have been meditating, the apostle says the same thing. The, in verses 18 through 22, he's saying creation is longing for regeneration, for the revealing of the sons of God, for God to regenerate the whole universe, the whole cosmos. And he goes on to say in verse 23, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, meaning Christians, born again children of God, we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. What is he saying here? He's saying this, not only creation. Yes, creation is longing for this renewal, this regeneration, for the purification of this cosmos, for this world. Yes, that is true, but not only they, but we who have the first fruits of the Spirit. Now, why is he using this word, the first fruits of the Spirit? Now, any of us who know farming, who does a little bit of agriculture, would understand what the first fruits mean. You see, when you plant a plant, what are you longing for? What are you looking for? You want to know whether it's going to be fruitful or not. And you are longing for that first fruits to show up. And the minute you see that first fruits, you are rejoicing. Why? It is a foretaste of the full harvest that is coming. Yes, this tree is, this tree is going to be fruitful. What I'm seeing now, the first fruits, is only a foretaste of the full harvest that is coming. The Spirit of God is the first fruits, is the down payment, is the pledge of the full inheritance, of the full glory that is coming for the believer. And because he knows this, if I'm experiencing the glory of God in a, fort, in a very shadowy form now, what will be its fullness and what does he do? He does this. He groans inwardly so that this first fruits might reach that full state, that full harvest where he can receive the full inheritance. He waits eagerly for adoption as sons. You remember I was telling you earlier, what is salvation's goal? Salvation's goal is to bring us to where Adam was when he first created, when he was first created. Bringing him into the, salvation's goal is bringing us into the immediate presence of God and enjoying God. Being at perfect harmony, perfect peace with God. This enjoying this eternal glory with God. And what is the apostle saying? Because we have received this pledge, this down payment. Oh, if this is so glorious, what about the fullness that is coming? That full redemption, that full salvation, wherein we will be in the very presence of the living God where we will enjoy this full glory and it has no end. This is an eternal glory. My dear friends, what it is to me to have the seal of the Holy Spirit, to enjoy that glory now, it is not some distant future. You and I as Christians are to enjoy God now that glory now. Christianity is personal. You and I ought to know God, wherein we can say with this personal inward, with all of our being, God, my Father. Oh, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Let me ask you this question. Can you say you have experienced this glory in a foretasty form like Crosby, like 
like the saints as we read in 1 Peter. Have you tasted this glory? What it means to receive the spirit, the seal of the spirit, that inheritance that is full, now you share or you experience in a foretasty form, in a shadowy form. And you know what happens when you experience this glory in this, in this foresh, in this foretasty form? Just as the apostle says, we long for that fullness. And you know what happens to us when we long for that fullness? We will see our position in this world as temporary, as transient, as strangers. We will say, like the writer of Hebrews, here we have no abiding city, for we seek a city that is to come. We seek a city that is to come. The apostle Peter says these words. I'm going to read 1 Peter 1 verse 13. This is what we do when we experience this glory in a shadowy, in a foretasty form. Therefore, prepare your minds for action and being sober-minded. Set your hope. Set your hope. What is this hope? This great eternal glory. Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ, meaning at the coming of Jesus Christ there will be a revelation of the fullness of this, uh, of this grace, of this glory. And we want, our lives will be aligned accordingly. Uh, I think our brother Anil last week was saying this, that salvation's goal, again, let me repeat it, is we come first and foremost into this reverence, into this filial fear, into this adoration of God. All other things are secondary, primary is this enjoying God. And once we enjoy this glory, the secondaries are secondary. What is the chief end of man? The chief end of man is to glorify God. To enjoy God. That's, that's, the, that's the goal of salvation. The seal of the Holy Spirit. Have we experienced this? Have we experienced, have we seen these evidences in our life? Is our understanding of salvation complete or is it partial? Christianity's end goal is that we might be in this father, son, father, daughter relationship to God. That's the gospel message. Anything short of it is you have not understood the gospel. May God give us grace that we would examine ourselves. We would seek this assurance. We would ask God to reveal himself to us that we would experience his glory like these early saints recorded for us in the New Testament. May the Lord give us grace. Let us pray. Our gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we ask God that you would help us to experience you, experience your presence in a deep, intimate way. 
Lord, help us to love you with all of our being. Lord, help us to share that glory in a foretasty form here on earth. Father, make our relationship to you personal, that we would love you, we would adore you, we would do everything because of our love for you. We would be lost in the grandeur and wonder of your love. Please give us grace, Lord. Father, we are prone to wander away. Father, remove every sort of ritualism, every sort of in-person experience from our lives. Draw us nearer to you, Lord. Please give us grace. Help us to do everything we do because we love you and we want to please you. Please give us grace. Fill us, Lord, with your spirit that we may enjoy your presence fully. We ask for grace. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior.